So this is module 26, the last in our series on memory, which we're going to be talking about forgetting memory construction and improving memory, which we all want to be able to do. So why is it not always a bad thing to forget? Wouldn't it be good to have brains that stored information like a computer so we could easily retrieve any stored item and not just the ones we rehearse? What would that feel like? Would there be any problems? Do you think you would have any problems if you never forgot anything? So if we remembered everything, maybe we couldn't prioritize the important memories. Um, it might have give us difficulties in thinking abstractly and making connections with our brain if our brain was so completely full. Um, if we kept, you know, compiling isolated bits of information. So what kind of things lead to forgetting? Brain damage, um, failures of encoding memory, so if you're not paying attention to something, you can't encode it. Storage decay, so over time our memories decay. Um, failures of retrieval, so not being able to, um, to access some of the memories. Interference, so um, being distracted and not being able to properly recall things. And motivated for getting, um, m like forgetting things on purpose. So forgetfulness is a form of freedom. This is a quote. And so while you might think that not forgetting anything might be a good thing, um, Jill Price has hyperthymesia. She not only recalls everything, but is unable to forget anything. Um, for Jill, both important and mundane things are always accessible, forming a running movie of images and information that runs simultaneously with current stimuli. So she's having trouble, she has trouble kind of filtering out the important things from the unimportant things, and she constantly has all these things running through her brain. She said, I'll be talking to someone and also seeing someone else. Another possible problem, if we were unable to forget, is that we might not focus well on current stimuli because of these intrusive memories. So it might al almost be like psychosis, like having these other kind of memories going through our brain while we're trying to focus on something else. The brain and the two-track mind, the case of Henry M. In 1950, um, Henry M. had his hippocampus removed because of severe seizures. But this, also, this stopped his seizures, but also ended his ability to form new explicit memories. Because if you recall from our previous lecture, the hippocampus is needed to form these new memories. And the memories kind of stay there for a few, a few days before they go into our long-term memory and, and they're stored properly. So he could learn new skills, procedures, locations of objects and games, but he had no memory of these lessons or the instructions. And why? For exactly the reason that I told you, um, because the working memory is stored in the hippocampus, and so our, our go, ha, transpire, like the long-term memory needs to go through the hippocampus in order to be stored into the long-term memory. So he's able to do it with his short-term memory, but then there's no um, storage available. But he also retained memories from before the surgery because his hippocampus was there, um, and so there there is information that has been stored. He just can't store any new information. So. Um, H.M., like another patient, Jimmy, could not understand why his face looked older than, 20, than 27 years in the mirror, and why not? Because he very much remembered himself um, as the 27-year-old the man, and he could not, you know, part of aging is recalling that we were going through the years, and he couldn't recall that information. So what he had was considered to be amnesia. Retrograde amnesia refers to the inability to retrieve memories of the past. H.M. and Jimmy suffered from hippocampus damage, and um, removal causing interrograde amnesia, so the inability to form new long-term declarative memories. They So retrograde amnesia is, means you can remember present stuff but not past stuff, and interrograde amnesia means you can remember past stuff but not present stuff. So they had no sense that time had passed since the brain damage, and while they were not forming new declarative memories, encoding was still happening in other processes called tracks. They could still learn how to get places, kind of automatic processing, and they could learn new skills through their procedural memories um, and acquired conditioned responses, but they could not remember any experiences which created these implicit memories. And so the hippocampus is really Im involved in the explicit memories kind of being sent into the long-term storage. So as we mentioned, there are two types of amnesia, a retrograde amnesia, which is the inability to retrieve memory of the past, and interrograde amnesia, which is the inability to form new long-term or long-term declarative or explicit memories. So retrograde amnesia can be caused by head injury or emotional trauma, and it's often temporary. It can also be caused by more severe brain damage, um, and therefore it also may include interrograde amnesia, so there just may be overall cognitive deficits. So HM and Jimmy lived with no memory of life after the surgery, so they were kind of stuck at the time where the injury or the accident happened. 
If you've ever seen the movie Memento, um, this is an example of retrograde amnesia. I hope that for those of you who have not seen it, I didn't give it away, but it's a very interesting movie. Um, and so you can kind of see that uh, for people who have retrograde amnesia, they wouldn't be able to remember things that happened before the trauma or surgery. People who have anterograde amnesia, they have no memory since the trauma or surgery. So here's a memory test for you. Um, what words and numbers in which locations are on the front of a US one cent coin? This is something we've seen many, many times in our life. Um, this should be easy because it was in the book. So the recognition test, choose the correct design from among these pictures. So which of these designs is the actual US one cent? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. So there, um, on the top right, you can see what it actually looked like. So if we got the penny image wrong, did we fail to retrieve the information? What could really have happened was that we never paid attention to the penny details, thus we, didn't, we weren't able to select them from the sensory memory or working memory. So even though we've looked at the pe a penny and paid attention to it, we hadn't bothered rehearsing it and coding it into long-term memory. So now I'm gonna go back. So take a look at this penny for a second. So now are you able to pick out which one it is? I think it's on the second row, second one in, but I could be mistaken. Yes, I think that was correct. So even when encoding, um, I still can't always retrieve it. So storage decay. Material encoded into long-term memory will decay if the memory is never used, recalled, or restored. So I took my first undergraduate degree in biochemistry and I learned an awful lot of stuff, most of which at this point I can no longer recall. So decay in long-term um, is long-term processing in reverse, or like pruning. Long-term potentiation, sorry, in reverse. So unused connections and networks will, um, wither when they're not used. So that's why it's very important if we want to re um, remember something that we periodically kind of dig it out of the archives. archives. So decay tends to level off. So memory for both nonsense syllables and Spanish lessons decays rapidly. So um, you can see that after even one or two days um, of after, one day after the lesson, our retention drops significantly and then levels off so that we remember about 20% of the stuff. Um, however, what doesn't decay tends to stay intact in long-term memory. So we have some recall even long, long, long after the initial Spanish lesson. So I guess that's telling us we learn about 20% of the material even if we, we study it. So the tip of the tongue phenomenon, this happens to me all the time. Um, especially with actors and movies. I can see it in my head, but I cannot retrieve the name. Um, so sometimes the memory itself doesn't decay. Instead, what decays are the associations and links that help us find the stored memory. Um, I have this happening to me a lot, and it's very frustrating. As a result, some stored memories seem just below the surface. You know, like, I know what that name is. It starts with a B, maybe, and as I said, I can visually see the person's face, but I just cannot get the name. So to prevent retrieval failures when storing and rehearsing memories, you can build multiple associations, linkages, rhymes, categories, lists, and cues. So part of this is that I've got a lot of stuff going on, so I'm not attending properly to a lot of the stuff I do, so I'm not forming the associations when the memory is encoded, which I need to do more of. And I'm hoping once my kids are a little older that my memory and ability to remember things will be improved. If not, I'm in big trouble. So interference and positive transfer. Another downside of not forgetting is that old and new memories can interfere with each other, making it difficult to store new memories and retrieve old ones. Um, occasionally the opposite happens, so in positive transfer, old information like algebra makes it easier to learn new related information like calculus. For example, um, one of the reasons that I hypothesize that I have trouble retrieving information is that I speak four languages, so therefore I have four sets of vocabulary in my head and I have to sort through all that stuff before I can pull something out. This is some, maybe just something that I say to myself to make myself feel better. But what it did help me with was that because I learned French in school coming from Canada, Spanish was very much easy for me because it was very similar in many ways, so I learned Spanish very quickly. So proactive interference occurs when past information interferes with learning new information. So 
You have many strong memories of a previous principle, and this me memory makes it difficult to learn a new principle's name. So you're very much associating the term principle with this old person, Mr. Smith, and therefore it's hard for you to learn uh, Ms. Jones's name. Um, you had to change email passwords, but you keep typing the old one and can't seem to memorize the new one. This happens to me all the time. I Honestly, I hate that I have to change passwords. So retroactive interference in sleep. Retroactive interference occurs when new stimuli or learning interfere with the storage and retrieval of previously formed memories. So in one study, students who studied right before, uh, right before eight hours of sleep had better recall than those who studied eight hours um, during their daily activities. So basically, if you want to remember better, study right before you go to bed. Um, and this way, your brain can process all that inform uh, information without a lot of distractions, and it will send it to the long-term memory better. So the daily activities that happened after the studying interfered with the morning's learning. So I just taught you a very important technique for learning better information, uh, keeping doing better on your tests. So passwords need to be stored in our memory. For security purposes, passwords should be different in a mix of numbers and symbols at least 10 digits long. So how, many, um, how can we remember so many passwords? Well, basically you have to have an Excel spreadsheet where you have them all written down, otherwise, honestly, you forget. But um, do we store them on our computers and our wallets to keep them safe? Probably not a good idea, but um, that's what I have to do. <laughs> but here are some password strategies. Use familiar retrieval cues without being too obvious. So use some, something that is meaningful to you. Minimize interference by repeating passwords or patterns to yourself multiple times. And rehearse passwords regularly so you should be able to, you know, remember your passwords different times. But memory is fallible and changeable and we can practice um, motivated forgetting, which is choosing to forget or change our memories. So Sigmund Freud, um, he's our psychoanalyst, believed that sometimes um, by making an, un uh, an unconscious decision to bury our anxiety-provoking memories, um, and we can do that and hide them from our conscious awareness. So things that are really painful from us, we could on some unconscious level kind of push them down. Things like, you know, if we've been sexually abused or something, and he called this repression. So new techniques of psychotherapy and medication interventions may allow us to erase um, and prevent reconsolidation um, of recalled memories. So motivated forgetting is not common. Um, it's more often that recall is full of errors and people try not to think about painful memories, but they're still there. So it's not that we can completely forget them. So forgetting can, be, um, can happen at any point in the memories process. So it can happen at the sensory part, the working memory part, the long-term storage or retrieval part. And the more that we process the information, we filter it, alter it, or lose much of it. So many times our memories are actually inaccurate. And the more you know, we kind of remember inaccurate memories, then we start having recall of these inaccurate memories. And that's how sometimes people have false memories. So why is our memory so full of errors? Memory not only gets forgotten, but it gets constructed. So imagine selected, changed, and rebuilt. I don't know if you have ever have memories that you know that are completely different. So memories are altered every time we recall. Um, and they're altered again when we reconsolidate the memory. So once we recall them and then put them back into our memory, back into long-term memory, they have changed from the original time that we, put, we pulled them out. Also, later information, so if we're now learning things, we now interpret our old memories in different ways, and so they affect the way that we learn the memories. So no matter how accurate and video-like our memories seem, it is actually full of alterations, and our memories are actually not very accurate. So ways in which our memory ends up being inaccurate guide the past. So the misinformation effect, imagination inflation, source amnesia, deja vu, and implanted memories, which we're gonna talk about. So Elizabeth Loftus, who is kind of a pioneer um, in uh, the memory game, in 1974 conducted an experiment with John Palmer and asked people to watch a video of a minor car accident. The participants were then asked how fast were the cars going when they hit each other. So this would be the actual accident that they show a video of. Those participants who were asked when the car, uh, instead of how fast were the cars when they hit each other, but how car fast were the cars when they smashed into each other, reported higher speeds and remembered seeing broken glass that wasn't there. So they misremembered the accident just by changing the word hit to the word smashed. Um, so this is incorporating misleading information into one's memory of the event. 
implanted memories. In one study, students were told a false story that spoiled egg salad had made them ill in childhood. As a result, many students became even less likely to eat egg salad sandwiches in the future. Another study by Elizabeth Loftus, people were asked to provide details of an incident in childhood when they'd be lost in a shopping mall. Even though there were actually had not been such an incident, by trying to picture details, most people came to believe that the incident had actually happened. Um, I, when I was in graduate school, one of the students actually implanted um, the, the memory in some people that people had had an, uh, an enema at some point when they were children, even though they had not, um, and they actually recalled that memory. So imagination inflation is simply by picturing an event, it can make it seem like a real memory. And once we have inaccurate memory, we tend to add more imagined details to it. So that, and that's something that we do perhaps for all our memories. And why does this happen? By visually and actually seeing an event, it activates similar areas in the brain and therefore it elaborates on the memory. So here's the lesson to take home. By trying to help someone recall a memory, you may actually be implanting a memory in their head. Um, and you can't actually tell how real a memory is by how real it feels because as we visualize it, we then incorporate different senses and feelings and it seems very real. Another way is through source amnesia or misattribution. And have you ever discussed a childhood memory with a family member only to find that the memory was from a movie you saw or a book you read or from a story someone told you about your childhood but they were kidding or from a dream you used to have? Sometimes I, I get in trouble because I remember things like so-and-so got divorced or so-and-so had a child and it was actually just a dream or a thought or we were discussing their situation and talking about whether they had a child and somehow I now remember that they have a child. Um, so if that happens, um, you're having um, source amnesia, so forgetting where the story actually came from and attributing the source to your own experience. Um, and I think all of us can have examples. So déjà vu, which is French for already seen. So déjà vu refers to the feeling that you've been in the situation before, that you've seen something happen before. Some people very strongly believe in déjà vu. Um, in an experiment in the text, students got the feeling because they were actually shown an image previously. However, we can feel very certain that we've seen a situation before, even when we've not, and this can be seen as source amnesia, a memory from current source memory that we misattribute as being from long-term memory. So why does this happen? Sometimes our sense of familiarity and recognition kicks in too soon, and our brain explains this as being caused by prior experiences. So if you have deja vu, it's not necessarily that you've already been there or done that. Um, it could just be kind of a trick of the mind. Constructed memories, and those of you who are going to continue on in psychology and the law are going to learn a lot about this and how this applies to court. So television courtroom shows make it look like there's often false testimony because people are intentionally lying. However, it's more common that there's mistaken testimony. People are trying to tell the truth but are overconfident about their memories, not realizing that their memories are actually constructions as we just talked about. We tend to alter our memories to fit current views, and this explains why hindsight bias feels like telling the truth. So when we're in love, we overestimate our first attraction. After the breakup, we recall being able to tell that it wouldn't work. So when we're in love, you know, you, you're, you're very much convinced this is the person you're going to spend the rest of your time with. However, after you break up, you can say, oh, I already knew that we were, it wasn't meant to be because of X, Y, and Z. But really, that wasn't the case. Constructed memories in children. Um, so with less time for their memories to become distorted, kids can be trusted to report accurately, right? Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, because kids have underdeveloped frontal lobes, they're even more prone to implanted memories. So in one study, kids who were asked what happened when an animal escaped in the classroom had vivid memories about the escape of the animal, but it didn't actually happen. For kids, even more than adults, imagined events are hard to differentiate from experienced events because kids have such vivid imaginations and sometimes it seems very real to them. So if you ever have to interview a child um, for any purpose related to the legal system, make sure that you do not lead them. Be very neutral and non-suggestive in your questioning because kids are often apt to come up with stories and they don't mean to be lying, but that's just because they have a very vivid imagination. So. Um, Sexual abuse memories can be trusted because they're flashbulb memories, right? Um, yes, but only if they're real. But in one study, right after a doctor gave a child um, an anatomically correct doll so that they had you know, genitalia, half of the children reported genital touching when none had actually occurred. So 
because they were primed with the, the genitals, they reported that they were touched even though it didn't happen. So again, even if a child reports sexual abuse, you have to be very careful because the consequences of such a report are very severe for the adult. We've all probably seen on TV people who recover memories of past abuse. I remember um, on Oprah Winfrey, I think Roseanne Barr talked about recovering memories of past abuse. So can people really recover memories that are so thoroughly repressed um, as to be forgotten? Um, abuse memories are more likely to be burned into memory than forgotten. So, um, you know, forgotten memories of minor events do reappear spontaneously, usually through cues. So, you know, we kind of activate some networks that we haven't used um, in a while, but those are generally for very minor events. But things such as abuse are things that we don't generally um, forget about. So an active process for searching for memories, however, is more likely to create details that feel real. So false memories are implanted by leading questions um, and may not actually be lies. People reporting events that didn't happen usually believe they're telling the truth. So by giving people leading questions, um, you're, you're actually implanting false memories that the person believes to be true. So they try, that's one of the problems when we have, you know, for example, a multiple personality disorder, oftentimes the, the therapists, there are certain therapists in the country that have many clients with these disorders, and what they found is that these therapists were actually implanting memories of alters into the patients, and so the patients then, you know, believe these alters to be real. As a result, unjust false memory accusation sometimes happens, even if no one intended to cause the injustice. So understanding reports of past abuse. While true repressed recover memories may be rare, unreported memories of abuse are common. Whether to cope or prevent conflict, many people try to get their minds or memories off the abuse. They don't rehearse the memories and sometimes the abuse memory fades. Um, because of infantile amnesia, the memories of events before um, age three are likely to be reconstruction. So if somebody says that they were abused before age three, it's probably not an accurate memory. Um, and this refers to both false reports and misreports of abuse. That doesn't mean that somebody can't be abused and they forget about it. So there's no clear way to tell when somebody has actually been abused. An implanted constructive memory can be just as troubling and more confusing than a memory from a direct experience. So now after these four modules, we've learned a lot about memory. So how do we use our memory to improve our grades is the take home question here. So um, we want to uh, construct as many retrieval cues as you can. So think of making connections, so meaningful things in depth, creating mnemonics such as songs, images, and lists. Minimize interference with related material or fun activities studied right before sleep or other mindless activities. Have multiple study sessions spaced further and further apart after learning the material first. Spend your study sessions activating your retrieval cues, so testing yourself. Also learn in the context with which you're going to recall the information and test yourself in study test uh, sessions. Practice doing retrievals of taking a test and overcome overconfidence error. error. If the material seems familiar, but can you explain it in your own words? So often comes having somebody quiz you and ask you what that means. So hopefully these four modules are going to help improve your memory and your performance on your school.